Mountain Rescue is a 24-hour day, seven days a week, 365 days a year voluntary service that saves lives in the most remote and adverse terrain. The Mountain Rescue Association, known as the MRA, was established in 1959, making them the oldest search and rescue association in North America. Today, the MRA consists of 100 teams across eight regions of the U.S. and Canada, representing over 3,000 volunteer rescue mountaineers. We work to improve the quality, availability, and safety of mountain search and rescue. The Mountain Rescue Association has grown to become the premier mountain search and rescue resource in North America. The MRA provides scenario-based, peer accreditation for rescue teams in mountain-specific rescue disciplines. Each team trains rigorously to national guidelines, practicing a variety of rescue scenarios to better prepare them for their next emergency. MRA teams perform over 5,000 search and rescue operations in North America each year. When needed, our teams work with local, regional, and federal agencies as well as state and provisional authorities and medical professionals to assist those in need and help save lives. Whether it's a hiker that stumbles, a climber that falls, or a child that wanders away from their family, Mountain Rescue Association teams are always there to help. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, our professional volunteers dedicate themselves to saving lives through rescue and mountain safety education. Operation, scope operation, team one, heading into the field. Mountain Rescue Association. Courage, commitment, compassion. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, it's really great to have you here and welcome to the second of our third Thursday events. Uh, my name is Charlie Shemansky. I'm privileged to be the education director for the Mountain Rescue Association and really thrilled that you'd join us. Um, the third Thursday events is the uh, latest in the education programs for the Mountain Rescue Association. We launched about four years ago our learning management system program, which now has nearly 5,000 students enrolled uh, worldwide. And Third Thursday program is now our new monthly live online program. It's the brainchild of uh, Michael St. John, who's both an at-large member of the MRA board and a longtime member of Marin County Sheriff's Search and Rescue. And I'm Really grateful to Michael for coming up with uh, that great program. In a moment, I'll introduce our sponsor for the night, which is PMI Rope, uh, no stranger to any of us. Um, and then we'll do a quick introduction by MRE President Doug McCall. And uh, then we'll go straight to our uh, presenters uh, for the evening. We're fortunate to have many sponsors for the National MRA. Uh, and PMI has been probably one of the longest lasting sponsors of the MRA. Uh, I'm also privileged to call their president and CEO, Louis McCurley, a dear friend. Louis and I both joined Alpine Rescue Team 35 years ago or so. Sorry, Louis, I guess I'm dating us. Louis's been with uh, PMI, I want to say since 1993 and, and became their, uh, their CEO not long ago. Louis, if you want to uh, take the virtual podium for a moment, then I'll get ready to share the video that uh, you've got on a new product. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, Louis McCurley. So I just wanted to thank you, Charlie, for that nice introduction. It's, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor to, to know you and to be a part of the Mountain Rescue community for several years. Um, I was just noting that I must have joined Alpine when I was 12, if that was 30 some years ago. Uh, but, it's especially it's it's especially cool to be part of the third Thursday program um, because it, MRA is uh, extremely near and near near and dear to my heart. Uh, I actually served a period of time as executive secretary with the national office in my base basement for the uh, for the MRA, 
And so now as, as CEO of PMI, it's, it's a great honor to be able to sponsor and help to support the work that all y'all are still out there doing. Um, we're proud to be a gold sponsor. Our focus at PMI in every way is education. As you probably know, we help to sponsor the, uh, the International Technical Rescue Symposium. We actually help to found the symposium. Um, and we also work with trying to get representatives to ICAR through MRA each year. For a number of years, we had hosted educational webinars for MRA on our PMI platform. And to see now how Charlie and you all have clearly evolved uh, the whole thing to a new level now with the third Thursdays is, is super, super cool. So PMI, as a manufacturer of life safety rope and equipment here in the United States um, since 1976, I imagine that a whole lot of you guys have our gear on your trucks. Thank you for that. Um, and, uh, and hopefully you know, as well as I do, that folk, our focus is on quality. And we're proud of the fact that our equipment actually meets the standards and the, the uh, specifications that we say it does. Because we back what we say with testing and research, you can rely on PMI. So the uh, video that we're gonna show you here is actually a video on a product that we've had uh, probably for about 20 years, but we've just done a video on it. So we're gonna share that with you today. Thank you, Louie. Appreciate uh, PMI and the many, many years of, of response and, and service to you guys and going all the way back to our, our dear friend, um, Steve Hudson, who we all appreciate and appreciate all your great leadership. So with that, I want to introduce the president of the National Mountain Rescue Association, just for a couple of quick comments, uh, Doug McCall. Doug McCall from Seattle Mountain Rescue has been in this post for um, many, many months with uh, about a year and a half left. And Doug, why don't you jump in? Thank you, Charlie. And uh, thank you to the to the Third Thursday crew for putting everything together. This is a really great uh, opportunity to reach uh, our individual rescuers. Um, also, thank you to our presenters uh, tonight for uh, presenting on hypothermia. I want to give a share a quick example of uh, how relevant these type these trainings can be. Uh, in Washington region, we had uh, Dr. Casey Edmark provide a training similar to this to our region uh, on hypothermia. Uh, the following weekend, or I think very close to that, we had a subject lost on Mount Rainier who was found by Tyler Serby of Tacoma Mountain Rescue. Uh, enable, you know, use those, that training right away. Um, and uh, the the subject actually died uh, when they arrived at the hospital. Uh, after 45 minutes of CPR, the doctors were able to revive the subject and uh, he's doing just fine, uh, which is pretty great. But it's really truly a testament to this type of training, to uh, the training that Dr. Edmark provided and to the care that our mount mountain rescue teams provide in the field every day. Uh, so I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to, to reach out to everybody. I uh, just wanted to share a couple of upcoming events. Um, uh, we launched, we're launching a community rescuer resource group on uh, December 28th. And then also the winter business meeting will be on February 6th, and February 7th. It'll be virtual. Uh, so we'll look for a Zoom for that. And we'll be sending out uh, registration to uh, to folks for to be able to attend to to, to be able to attend that. 
Uh, I think that's all I, I've got. So I'll turn it back over to Charlie. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. And thanks for the great leadership you guys have, have been doing. So, I mean, for all of us, life has slowed down a little bit with, with COVID, but I can assure you folks that the MRA leadership has got the uh, pedal to the ground and working really, really hard. So with that, let me introduce our presenters. But before I do, let me tell you that uh, the Q&A portion at the end of tonight's program ideally is not going to be opened up to all now nearly 200 of you. We've got about 200 attendees. We're going to ask you instead uh, to post any questions you have in Q&A. And I'll be moderating the Q&A and I'll be writing down questions and I'll throw them to our presenters at the end of the program. I think it's just gonna be hard to open up 200 microphones and not have you all step on top of each other. So with that, just post your questions during, during the program to the Q&A. So the MRA is, you know, we're really blessed to have at our disposal professionals from a broad spectrum of search and rescue professionals, medical professionals, and in the case of tonight, a number of um, higher education institutions and in particular, the University of California at San Diego has really specialized expertise and tonight's pre presenters are associated with that program. Uh, Dr. Lauren Altshu is an emergency medical physician and also a fellow, a fellow in the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. Um, she's working on her, on her DIM diploma, that's a diploma in mountain medicine, and also her diploma in diving and marine medicine. She's the recent past wilderness medicine fellow at the University of California, San Diego or UCSD and also chair of the Wilderness Committee for the Emergency Medicine Residents Association. He came to wilderness medicine uh, after 15 years as a professional ski patroller, a hiking guide and a sailing instructor. Um, she lectures also nationally on avalanche awareness and wilderness first aid. She's joined tonight by Dr. Miguel Pineda, uh, who's originally from Columbus, Ohio, he earned his undergraduate degree in biology from Penn State University and attended med school at the Ohio State University. Uh, currently the 2020-2021 uh, Wilderness Medicine Fellow at UCSD with uh, interest in mountain medicine and wilderness ultrasound. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to introduce uh, Drs. Lauren Alchu and uh, Miguel Pineda and presenting hypothermia and uh, associated maladies. Doctors, it's all yours. Thank you, Charlie and Doug. We really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you guys. Um, we got a lot of friends in this audience and uh, hopefully we'll, you guys will learn something tonight that you can uh, take out in the field. Thanks so much for having us guys. All right, let's get it started. So this is hypothermia and associated maladies. Neither myself nor Lauren have any major disclosures, except that I'm a cold weather wimp. Moving on. All right, so cold illnesses, why do we care? So cold illnesses uh, encompass pretty much wide variety of uh, urban and rural terrain, um, also cover both uh, land and water injuries, so relevant here, uh, us out here in San Diego, uh, as well as across the country, and also can have a, a very wide variety of morbidity and mortality, both including frostbite and uh, hypothermia. So uh, important to keep in mind with um, cold injuries that it's not just the temperature that comes into play, but also wind speed and to an effect moisture. Um, so this is why wind chill, which is really the combination of temperature and wind speed comes into such a major play with determining uh, how cold you are going to feel that day. Um, and then, like I said, uh, moisture does have an effect. Uh, clothing and appropriate barrier protection are your uh, biggest protective barriers against any of these uh, any of these cold illnesses. So really it's a spectrum of disease. So we have local disease, which goes all the way from frost snip, chill blains, trench foot and frostbite, and all the way up to systemic uh, disease, which uh, hypothermia, much higher morbidity and mortality. So as far as our local cold illnesses, uh, we have uh, frost snip, which is really just surface uh, frost formation on top of the skin. You don't get any vascular involvement. You don't get any ice crystal formation and it is reversible. 
Um, then you have chilblains, which is some vascular inflammation on local ischemia, but you don't have any major ice crystal formation, um, mostly causes uh, some erythematous changes uh, within the skin. You have trench foot, which is really pretty much waterlogging of uh, the distal extremities. So this is where the actual tissues get saturated with water and you get an inflammatory response secondary to that. Um, and then finally you get frostbite, which is actual ice crystal formation within the cells and tissue themselves um, and does cause irreversible uh, ischemia and damage. So just as far as uh, chilblains and trench foot are concerned, these ones that you might not see as commonly, chilblains is here on the left. You can see the redness of the skin there, just vascular uh, inflammation. Um, and then trench foot over here on your right, you see kind of the waterlogging of the feet. Um, this is a uh, reason it's called trench foot is uh, really came to prominence back in World War I with kind of your trench warfare where people were standing in ankle deep water for days on end. Um, and then you get pretty much uh, the full saturation of the tissues and the secondary inflammatory response from that. So frostbite is the main thing that we'll have a focus on here today. Um, frostbite, once again, is the ice crystal formation that you have in the cells and the tissues. Um, and really it, it develops in kind of this um, subsequential uh, layering um, of effects. So really you start off with a pre-freeze, which is pretty much the blood vessels constrict down. You don't have any ice crystals yet at this point, but this is where you start having the significant pain in the extremities, as well as kind of the pins and needles sensation in the extremities. And this is due to the nerves actually being cooled. Next, you develop the freeze thaw. Um, which is when you do start developing crystals both in the cells and around the cells, the cells will rupture because of this. And then you do get an inflammatory response uh, both due to the ischemia and if you're able to rewarm due to the reperfusion. After this, uh, you get the vascular stasis, which is pretty much the significant uh, constricting and dilating of the actual blood vessels. And you get significant leakage from the blood vessels into the soft tissues which can clot up and also cause significant swelling. Then finally, you get the late ischemic changes, which is the actual tissue infarction. Um, so this is where you actually have cell death. You have significant inflammation from the inflammatory cytokines. You can get blood clots, both epilion and thrombi that develop in these uh, extremities. And then you get um, pretty significant cell death, both from the vasculature and from the cells. So frostbite, we uh, have multiple different classification methods for breaking down the severity of it. Um, all in all, it's very difficult to tell um, until you've actually thawed the tissues how severe it's gonna be. Um, the traditional method, really, we think about classifying it similar to a burn. Um, you have first degree, which is partial thickness and some redness, second degree, which is full thickness and you get some redness and swelling. You can get clear blisters here. Third degree is when you actually start getting um, some fatty tissue involvement. And this is where you can actually get blood vessels uh, involved and get blood blisters secondary to that. And then fourth degree is when we get very deep down into tendons, muscle, and bone. Um, and this is when you actually start getting the black and the necrotic appearance to it. More modernly, we kind of think about it uh, as far as how bad the cyanosis or the purple change is uh, after the thawing occurs. So grade one, really, uh, you don't have much uh, after thawing. Grade two, you start getting some of it down to the distal tips of the toes and fingers. Grade three, you start getting it to the middle of the toes and fingers. And then grade four, you'll actually get it all the way up to the base of the knuckles of the hands and feet. Um, and then concurrently along with this, as you get along with the severity uh, of the spectrum, you get more and more tissue loss associated. So just so you guys have kind of picture uh, image of how this appears, First degree, you can have kind of some mild color changes, but really kind of white discoloration, a little bit of redness. Second degree, here you get these clear blisters that develop on the fingers and on the toes. Third degree, once again, you kind of get this blood blister development. And then fourth degree is where you get the true mummification and uh, the necrosis of the extremities. You get this black and charred appearance. So just because we're talking about the different classifications, we do have kind of a, a newer one called the Cauchy classification, which is coming around, which purely says uh, pretty much we're gonna measure how severe this is after the thawing, just as far as how proximal the lesions go. So you have from zero all the way to, uh, with no lesion, extending all the way up to carpals and tarsals, which is really, that's pretty much all the way at the base of your hands and feet for the severity of how bad the lesions associated with the frostbite extends. 
So risk factors for frostbite, um, having frostbite previously uh, is a risk factor, both due to the fact that uh, you're more likely to put yourself in these situations and also the fact that the tissue itself already has some cell damage um, that makes you more um, at risk for it to develop again. Anything that's going to make you not as aware uh, or not able to protect yourself from uh, cold entry, so psychiatric illnesses, drugs and alcohol, uh, are going to make you more likely to develop frostbite because you don't have the natural response to protect yourself from it. Dehydration, hypoxia play uh, a route because they don't allow you to get as much blood flow to the extremity or as much uh, oxygen and nutrients out there. And in the same vein, any kind of peripheral vascular disease and diabetes uh, that don't allow appropriate blood flow will increase your risk for frostbite. So with frostbite, really prevention is key. So you wanna make sure that you have um, appropriate tissue perfusion because blood flow equals heat and equals nutrients and oxygen. In order to do this, uh, you wanna make sure that you maintain core temp and hydration. And like I said, we'll get into hypothermia a little bit later. Being able to cover the skin to avoid any of that vasoconstriction would, that, that would cut off the blood flow. Being able to maintain nutrition that way your body is able to uh, continue to produce enough heat to keep these extremities warm. Um, if you're uh, in a, if the person themselves are hypoxic or you're at significant altitude, you want to be able to supply supplemental oxygen, basically to be able to provide appropriate blood uh, blood flow and oxygen in that area. Exercise can help prevent uh, significant injury by allowing the eye to have uh, appropriate peripheral vasodilation. However, this does come with the caveat of need to be able to avoid exhaustion. So if that's your only mode of preventing frostbite, eventually you're going to tire out and not be able to continue to systemically provide that kind of heat. Um, while there is uh, a quick uh, and a, a measurable transition of uh, kind of temperature uh, for how quickly you can develop frostbite, um, it's not really a set established time frame for how long between when you develop the numbness, pins and needles to the actual development of frostbite tissue injury. So as far as what we can do as far as field treatment and frostbite for coming across victims, biggest thing is to be able to allow passive rewarming um, and avoid refreezing. Um, so uh, with frostbite, of course, we want to be able to thaw it out and get it to where we have appropriate perfusion but you can significantly increase uh, the severity of the injury um, if you uh, allow the tissue to thaw out and then refreeze again. So while we uh, will go into a little bit more what we do for passive rewarming, while the ideal treatment is warm water bath at 40 to 42 degrees Celsius, we really only wanna do this if we can have that extremity maintain that temperature from there on out. Big part of, of frostbite treatment is treating any kind of concurrent hypothermia. If you can warm the core, it significantly increases the ability to warm the extremities. You do run a risk of any kind of jewelry or clothes getting entrapped due to the impending swelling and edema that will develop. So you want to make sure you get these, uh, these bits of jewelry and clothing off early before the swelling occurs. You do want to make sure that you prevent any kind of uh, strenuous use or basically abrasive trauma to the affected limb since the skin and the tissue is uh, hypersensitized. Um, so with this, uh, you don't want to perform any kind of friction rewarming and you really want to avoid any kind of blister rupture. Um, also because blister rupture will put you at more of a risk of any kind of sub, uh, secondary tissue infection. Um, we can provide oxygen, once again, if the patient is hypoxic or for an altitude. And also there's more and more data coming through on portable hyperbarics um, to be able to treat frostbite in the field if we're set up in an environment where we can provide that. Um, hydration is key if the patient is fluid down. Basically, uh, this allows us to increase the amount of blood flow to the extremity. All of this is what we can do in the field. Once we get to the hospital, um, there are more advanced measures that we can do. So we can do um, intraarterial thrombolytics and TPA to be able to break up any blood clots that have developed and increase blood flow to the affected extremities. Hydrotherapy um, can be performed twice a day to debride any devitalized tissues. Um, hyperbaric oxygen can increase the ox uh, oxygenation to the ischemic tissues themselves. And it's one of the uh, appropriately indicated measures that insurance will cover hyperbaric oxygen therapy for. And then also in the hospital, we wanna make sure that their tetanus is updated simply because once again, this tissue injury can set you up for a kind of tetanus infection. 
So as far as advanced pharmacological treatment in the hospital, um, intraarterial PDPA and thrombolytics does reduce clot formation and ischemia. This has high level of evidence that it is effective, all the way up to 1C. Systemic uh, antibiotics and tetanus both prevent secondary infections. It's been well proven that these uh, are effective. Um, some of vasodilators like prostacycline and iloprost um, are, uh, are effective. This isn't anything that we're going to cover in the field, but um, there is more and more data coming across uh, about uh, using these in significant frostbite injuries. Some things that we may be able to cover uh, carry in the field that we can use, but um, aren't necessarily as high level of data are ibuprofen and aloe vera. Um, both of these um, can decrease the amount of prostaglandins um, and thromboxane, which are kind of some of your inflammatory mediators that uh, can cause worsening uh, inflammatory response in the tissue. Um, and while the evidence isn't great, um, there's low risk of any harm in giving these in the field. Um, and then um, low molecular weight dextran, um, it can kind of decrease the blood viscosity. Not great data on it, um, but it is another measure that they can try in the hospital to see what they can be able to. Uh, tissue they can salvage. So big key points with frostbite, don't actively unfreeze any extremity unless you can keep the extremity unfrozen because secondary refreezing causes significantly worsening tissue injury. Avoid any kind of friction rewarming because the uh, tissue itself is hypersensitized uh, in this kind of condition. Emollients, um, uh, won't really prevent frostbite. Um, there is, and there is some data that shows they can actually worsen the actual tissue injury itself. Severity of frostbite is very difficult to determine prior to thawing, so always kind of just err on the side of caution and don't uh, go about attempting to amputate anything anytime soon. And then once again, standard of care is warm water bath at 40 to 42 degrees Celsius. Um, if you can get them to a location where you can maintain that warmth. All right, now we're going to switch gears to our other cold malady, and that's hypothermia. And we're going to start off with a video that shows one of the best portrayals I've ever seen of hypothermia on television. Um, this is from an adventure show that was on Amazon Prime this summer. It shows an um, adventure racer who'd been in the water for several hours um, showing some signs of hypothermia. So let's watch that. bien mojados y a los muchos horas salimos a las tres y media todos juntos ¿no? es un marrón también tienes hipotermia para es morir no, es que yo quiero Okay. How long has he been like this? Bad. I need you to step up for me. So there's different stages to hypothermia, and ultimately you can develop heart arrhythmias and can die. Can you hear me? All right, he's shown pretty severe hypothermia, um, and so they had to do some some pretty aggressive treatment for him in that in that situation. So we're gonna kind of switch gears here, talk about our systemic cold illness. And there's only one, we don't have to remember a lot of them, and that's hypothermia. So the definition, let's start with that. So hypothermia at its, at its simplest is a drop in core temp between 35 degrees C or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'll switch back and forth a little bit between Celsius and Fahrenheit, for those of you not from uh, the US, but either way, that's kind of where we start. Um, at, basically what's happening is you're having net loss of heat from the body, not surprisingly. Um, and it can happen in a lot of different environments. It can happen both indoors and outdoors. It can happen in any season, including down here in Southern California. Um, and oftentimes we'll see it in settings where folks are away from resources, disaster settings, outdoor recreation settings, but also in urban environments. Um, when I did my training actually in Pennsylvania, we had a lot of hypothermia there from our urban adventurer population. What happens when you get cold? So the body is pretty good at preventing, at keeping our temperature normal. We start by shivering, which is basically we're trying to vasoconstrict and hold on to our cold and then generate heat. But at some point that shivering doesn't really work anymore. And usually that's when temp gets below about 31 degrees C. 
at that point, everything kind of starts to slow down. Your heart, your respiratory rate, your brain, your GI function. And that's when we really start to see some of the more severe effects. So in the brain, we'll see things like folks will get irritable, they'll get confused, they'll, be, they'll pass out, they'll be in a coma. And then we get these really funky things called paradoxical undressing, which there's not a really great understanding of what happens, but essentially the thought is that it's a, a, almost a burrowing mechanism and it's part of our intrinsic uh, response when you get cold enough that uh, you start, start not thinking real well and start uh, looking for a warm place to, to get to, which seems really weird that you would undress for it. But the bottom line is you're just not getting enough blood flow. You're not getting enough oxygen. You're not getting enough nutrients to kind of keep your brain doing what it's supposed to be. On the cardiovascular front, our blood volume is going to drop because our heart rate's not going to, our heart's not going to pump as well. We're also going to get a shift of fluid. So you're going to tend to get fluid that's going to shift out of the vascular system. And so you're going to get, your, your blood volume is going to concentrate and you're going to get some swelling from that. And then also we're going to have some pulmonary problems because our respiratory rate is going to slow down. So we're going to tend to get our patients going to get acidotic as well. We actually see this on EKGs for any of you guys who work um, in an environment where you can get these. And these are called Osborne waves or J waves. And you see that kind of prominently here. It kind of looks like a little bit of a J. And that's very common in hypothermic patients. It's not necessarily a dangerous thing, although there are definitely some dangerous arrhythmias that you can have. So how do we classify hypothermia? So there, we have the Swiss system, um, which is basically looking at four different stages that is dependent on temperature, but is also dependent on your symptoms. So initially we start with your awake patient, your shivering patient. Once you get into that moderate stage, now they're not shivering anymore. Now they're getting tired of time some mental status changes. When you get to severe, they're most likely unresponsive. And then we get to profound down to below 20 degrees C. Now you're not gonna even see vital signs. Now, it doesn't mean they don't have them. They might be very, very slow. So how can we assess temperature in the field? It's really challenging. The gold standard to assess temperature for these folks is we're trying to get a core temperature. So either with a, an esophageal temperature probe, which you're going to put down an endotracheal tube. I don't know about you guys, but I don't carry that in the field. Or a rectal temperature, which can be a little challenging to get if you've got someone you're trying to keep warm and fully dressed. Um, also, we always have a concern about hardware fracturing or breaking. I don't know about you, I don't want a mercury temperature breaking in someone's bottom. Um, also, the temperature measures that we do have in the field, a, a thermo, uh, infrared or a thermometer temperature, aren't real accurate. Um, and typically, an oral temperature is not going to measure below 35 degrees C. So many times, we're not going to be able to get an accurate temperature reading in the field. And that's when we really have to go by their symptoms to kind of judge what their stage of hypothermia is until we get them into an environment with more and more monitoring. So there's this great thing called the cold card. Um, this was developed by Gordon Giesbrecht up in Canada, who is the king of hypothermia research and likes to throw people in lakes um, in the middle of winter. And he talks about different stages of hypothermia as far as the symptoms go. And we kind of even stress, even before we get to myothermia, we talk about cold stress. So you're having effects from the cold, but you haven't crossed into that range of uh, that below 95 that mild hypothermia. Um, the cold card has some fantastic treatment recommendations for each stage. And then on the back of the cold card, we actually have some, some rewarming methods as well. Um, and here's the things that we can really can do in the field. So the first thing we do is we talk about insulative rewarming. So getting them into a, a confined space that is going to retain the heat they have and hopefully add some heat to the system. And we got a couple examples of that. Um, we wanted to avoid body to body rewarming. You're getting in naked in the sleeping bag with someone else. Um, really not an effective way to do, to do it. You're, the amount of heat that you can put out and give to them is really minimal. And now potentially you get two hypothermic patients. And we want to be careful with our chemical packs. The um, last thing we want to do is now cause burns in addition to hypothermia. So here's the back of the cold card, um, a burrito wrap or a hypothermia wrap. And the key here is to do three layers. Um, if the person has dry clothing or relatively dry clothing, we're going to leave their clothing on. If it's super wet, we don't want that cold, wet clothing to get them colder, so we're going to get them stripped down. We want to apply heat to the places where they can get the most heat transfer, oftentimes the axilla, the chest, the groin. We want to make sure they've got a hat on so they're not losing more heat through their head. And then our three layers, we're going to start with a vapor barrier layer, typically a plastic bag um, layer or a heat blanket will work for this as well. Then we want to have our warmth layer, and that's going to be something like a sleeping bag or a blanket. And then on the outside, we again want a vapor barrier layer to such as a tarp, and that'll help prevent 
um, more heat loss and more, more moisture loss across in there. A lot of times when if I'm wrapping someone like this in the field, I'm actually going to tape a stethoscope to their end blood pressure cup to them and have that inside the bag so I can continue to get vitals without having to unwrap them. It truly makes monitoring easier. We, of course, want to leave their face exposed because we want to still be able to talk to our patients if they're talking to us, and we don't want to obstruct their airway. And a burrito wrap or a hypothermia or hypo wrap is a fantastic way to try to maintain the heat they have and prevent future further losses, especially for that mild to moderate patient um, who may not be able to assist in their own rescue, but isn't um, at the point yet where they're having cardiovascular collapse. There's some other techniques out there, some other devices, and these are going to actually add heat to the system. So they work similar to a hypo wrap. It can work with a hypo wrap. Um, but we have the Norwegian cold burning heat pack, which I, I actually have never seen in practice. Um, and then the HPMK, which is really commonly used in the military. And these are basically heat packs. You see them kind of similar to MRE heating packs that you're going to pack around the patient in those same areas and then have a wrap around to go with it. Now, those are really the things that we can do in the field. Um, and the rates that you can warm someone, we're talking about basically single digit an hour. Um, 1.5 cc uh, degrees an hour of rewarming it with these non-invasive measurements. Once we get to the in-hospital setting, we have a lot more options to it. And that's really by um, looking at things that are going to get heat into their body as opposed to around their body. So things like warm IV fluids, a peritoneal lavage or, or thoracic lavage, where we'll actually put tubes in the peritoneal and thoracic cavities and run warm water in there. And then the gold standard right now for someone with severe hypothermia, life-threatening hypothermia, is actually ECMO um, or cardiopulmonary bypass. And the rates that you, rewarming rates you can get on ECMO are fantastic. Um, and most of the hypothermia research right now, or at least a large portion of it, is actually looking at taking ways to push ECMO further out into the field setting, um, stuff that they're doing a lot of in Europe right now, um, because there's such, such rapid rewarming with, with ECMO. And there's a really neat score out there uh, for any of you guys who work in an in-hospital environment too, and that's called the HOPE score. And what that does is it basically looks at your patient and their characteristics and says, are they a candidate for something like ECMO rewarming? This is another guideline that I really like. Um, this is the WMS guidelines, the Wilderness Medical Society's guidelines for management of a hypothermic person. Again, this kind of expands on the cold card and talks about should we suspect it? How, how do we classify it? And what are the measures that we can use um, to treat it and prevent it? And so we talk about initially with mild hypothermia, preventing further cooling and some passive rewarming. Once you get to moderate, we're talking about more active uh, measures when we talk about the HPMK. And then for our severe patient, this is someone who's profound hypothermic, who doesn't have vitals or is very, very slow vitals, um, using some more of those invasive measuring devices, which is a really nice algorithm to have. And this is something you could print out and put into your kits if you wanted to. A couple things we want to talk about is some pitfalls with rewarming. We've kind of already talked about skin burns with, with uh, our HPMK and our, our external heat packs. Um, but there's a couple concepts that are a little bit weird that are, when we're rewarming someone, things that we want to prevent. The first one's called cold temperature after drop. And basically the way this works is you've got someone that you've been rewarming and you're getting, getting them warmed up. You're starting to bring them up out of the stages of hypothermia. The core blood, which has been warmed, is moving out to the cold tissues in their arms and their legs, which have been clamped down and vasoconstricted while they're cold. And at first, the cold blood that was at the extremities is now going to the core. And so basically what they get is this cold shock that is a really nasty hit to the heart. And it can put them into some fatal dysrhythmias. And so one of the ways we can avoid this is being very careful with our patient when we're um, moving them after they've been rewarmed. So there's someone who's maybe in the moderate category. They're not unconscious. They're cold. They're not really working too well. They're kind of our guy in our video. Um, but we get them warmed up. We don't want to have these people walking out. Okay. We want to be getting them out, hopefully in a horizontal line. You see this also in folks that we bring in with water. So if we're doing a hoist, we don't want to be doing a hoist that's vertical. We'd rather have a hoist that's horizontal for that same reason. The other pitfall is kind of more along the lines of that water thing. It's a circumrescue collapse. Um, this is something that we see um, basically person's been treading water, cold water. They've been treading water. They've been keeping themselves up. They've been keeping their, their um, heat production up. They're about to get rescued. They kind of take, go from, I'm going to independent, I'm going to save myself to someone else is going to save me. And they calm down their catecholamine level, which has basically been keeping them going. 
drops and they go into fatal dysrhythmia. Um, there's not a lot that we can do to fix this, but it's one of those things to be aware of when you're ready for it or anything else. And the same thing is when you're in that water for a long time, that cold water, you're gonna have basically where your blood flow is gonna change when you go from water to air. And so you can have blood pooling in the legs um, and decrease blood flow to the heart. Again, hypotension, cardiovascular collapse. So things we wanna avoid. Things, not that we just wanna avoid, we wanna be aware of and watching out for them so that if we do expect them to go in arrhythmia, that way we are we're prepared for it when it happens. And then one last piece on this, and this is not so much rewarming pitfalls, but they're really, really cold, okay? So you've all heard the saying, they're not dead till they're warm and dead. And I wanna put the big caveat on that as except when they're dead, right? You're not gonna bring back someone who's been in the cool ice chest for a month. It's just not gonna happen. And so that's, there's some criteria that we use and the WMS has come up with that basically says, when is it futile to try to rewarm these things, okay? So one big one, non-survivable trauma. If their head and their body are disconnected, you're not bringing that person back. Uh, same notion, if they got had the trauma first and died from the trauma and then got cold, you're not bringing them back. And then another big one is that their chest wall is frozen solid, right? You can't do CPR on these folks because they're not, they're not actually getting down to the heart. You're not gonna be able to. That being said, there are some insane stories of folks that are surviving very, very cold temperatures. Adults down to 56, kids even lower down to 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And these folks are doing really well when they survive. They actually come in neuro intact because fortunately cold is protective for the brain. Um, there is some levels though at which though with lab values, you can say, all right, probably not gonna bring them back. And that's a very low pH down to 6.5 and potassium that's very high. We've had enough cell death that we can say, okay, if they're beyond those categories, the odds of bringing them back are very, very slim to nil. Um, in the field, there's been some criteria that we can look at and say, basically, once you get their temp up north of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and they've been at that level 30 minutes, you're doing CPR at 30 minutes, or the potassium is very high, you're not going to get them back. You've given them a shot to come back. Um, and for avalanche victims, we look at a burial that's longer than 45 minutes. So at that point, it's more like the trauma or hypoxia that's already killed them. And Kind of going forward with our uh, our wild stories of survival, this is this is one of my favorites. So Anna Bangerholm, this was back about oh, 10, 10, 15 years ago now. So she was a surgery resident, orthopedic surgery resident in Norway, and she was backcountry skiing her day off and went headfirst into the icy stream. Fortunately, she didn't drown. She had an air pocket, um, but it took her quite a while, it took about 80 minutes to extricate her. And her temp, she was at 56.7. She spent 35 days in the ICU on ECMO, and she came out of it with almost complete neuro recovery, which is fantastic. Um, she's no longer an orthopedic surgeon, uh, but she's now a radiologist, little lipstick staring into her other injuries, uh, but she was back at work within, within a few months. And this quote from the bottom is actually from the ER doctor who took care of her in Norway, that she was dilated pupils, she was flaxen white, she's wet and ice cold and looked absolutely dead. Which is why when we think about these folks, as long as they don't have other injuries or other reasons they shouldn't, couldn't survive, even if they're they look dead and they have no signs of life, we want to give them a shot. Because um, when they then they do come back, it's pretty amazing. There's a couple of guidelines that they've come up with um, as far as doing advanced cardiac life support on these folks who are super cold. Um, and this is stuff that, that would take an effect in the field um, as well as in your EMS transport. So the thing is we don't wanna be rough handling these folks. Um, if they don't have a fatal arrhythmia yet, just by jostling them could put them into that. And so rather if we have a Lucas, which is a mechanical CPR device, rather we'd rather use that than have people doing CPR on them. Um, and also it's gonna last a lot longer. You can do CPR on these folks sometimes for hours when it's not a 20 or 30 minutes like we normally would call in the field. And so because of that, you're just gonna exhaust your resource, you're gonna exhaust your rescuers um, if you're going that long. We want to be careful again with the irritation, both in, in using pads and using central lines. Um, we want to try not to irritate that heart as much as possible. Now, as far as doing shocks with either with our AED or with our uh, defibrillators, we really want to hold off on shocks until they're, they're 30 degrees C. And that's because really they're not shown to be effective at that point. So we'll continue with compression only CPR until we get to that temp. And then usually we'll wait and do one shock every one or two degrees in warm up. Medications, 
epinephrine, amiodarone, lidocaine, atropine really don't work when they're cold. Um, the body just doesn't process them well. And so we want to hold off on any medications until we get to that time, or we want to decrease our dosing. Um, because what the risk is, is that when they get warm enough and those medications then get activated, you could have actually massive cardiovascular upright, up regulation, which can be dangerous as well. So be wary with your drugs. So kind of going through the, some of the key points here with hypothermia. So the fastest rewarming mechanism may not necessarily be the best. If you can maintain perfusion, if you can maintain that CPR, you may not necessarily need to get them warmed right this second. It's about doing it that's safest for you and your resources to continue that resuscitation. We talked about surf and rescue collapse, trying to keep them horizontal. And that means you're, we're carrying these folks out, even if they're moderate hypothermia. We want to be gentle with them. If they're awake, we want to keep them mentally stimulated. We want to keep them talking and interacting with us. We talked about our hypothermia wrap, using insulation like our sleeping bag and our vapor barriers to prevent cooling. And the real key here, because we can't measure temperature usually in the field with accuracy, we're going by more how our patient looks and how they're responding than what their absolute numbers are. All right, any questions that you guys have? Hey, Miguel um, and uh, Lauren, thank you. First off, I, you said any questions in your video cut out, so I'm guessing we're going to Q&A at this point. You got it. Um, and you're unmuted, so thank you. I'm just going to summarize some of the Q&A that I saw um, in the chat. <clears throat> and, and, and while they're answering, anybody that has any other questions, um, post them in the chat to begin with, because we've got more than 200 attendees, and I'm worried we're all going to talk all, all over each other. Somebody asked, by the way, Seth asked earlier if there's any way to get credit for CEUs for these trainings and uh, appreciate the question. I'll look into them, uh, look into that to see exactly what it would take in the future, but we won't be able to do that. I also want to piggyback a little bit on what Lauren talked about on the HOPE score. Um, it, MRA has been a great supporter of ICAR, the International Commission for Alpine Rescue, and many of the uh, American, Swiss, and Austrian uh, leaders in the Avalanche program have been using the HOPE score. You all might want to Google it up. There's a whole bunch of med research out there. HOPE basically stands for hypothermia outcome prediction after extracorporeal life support. Um, basically, about every five years, the European Resuscitation Council looks at resuscitation protocols, and in particular for avalanche rescue. So those of you that do a lot of avalanche rescue, I'd really in, in, um, encourage you to look at the HOPE score. We used to use serum potassium as a marker and Lauren and, and uh, Miguel, maybe you guys can, can address this, but now with the HOPE score, um, serum potassium is not the only marker for um, hypothermia outcome prediction. I don't know if you guys wanna elaborate a little bit on that, but it is finding its, the HOPE score is finding its way into the uh, into the avalanche uh, community as well for survivability. Um, so do you guys wanna just elaborate a little bit more on that? And then I'll go to a whole bunch of other questions. Sure, it's a, it's a great tool. Um, and it's it's something that, you know, even thinking through cases, if you Google it, there's a calculator that they have online. You can plug in kind of sample patient characteristics and kind of see what the benefits would be. Um, so you're basically looking at who the person is, um, what their underlying conditions are, as well as some of those, those markers to try and predict who's going to have the best chance of success. Um, and so there's the data is pretty good behind it and, and adding more data by the, the case. Um, they actually have a data collection tool as well. Um, but it, it can be really useful when you're thinking about your resuscitation, when you're you know, 15, 20 minutes into it, 30 minutes into it, and you say, should we continue? You know, is this someone who's going to have a chance to get back? Or is this we're using our resources for futility sake? Um, and so definitely a neat thing to, to play around with. And I should add that uh, Manuel Genswein in Switzerland has created the mountainsafety.info website. MRA is a uh, subscriber to that. And Oyvind Henningsen uh, up in Washington is going to be emailing MRA teams uh, really shortly in the next several days on how to get into MSI, the mountainsafety.info website, um, where you can download a whole bunch of stuff on the HOPE score. We're lucky in the United States, there's a couple of uh, American physicians who are very involved in this work. Uh, Dr. Scott McIntosh at the University of Utah, uh, emergency room physician, and Dr. Daryl uh, Macias 
who's down in Albuquerque at the University of New Mexico. I should also mention everybody look in the chat because people have been texting and when we end this call, I'm gonna keep the line open and keep the chat open for a while so you can go through it. But somebody sent a link to the uh, cold card poster uh, on chat. There's a bunch of good things on chat. So, um, so let me just, let me run through some questions. Lauren and Miguel, uh, one question came in from Tom Chappell, assuming initial frostbite is sort of the zero on the time chart. Can you estimate the elapsed time with all other variables remaining sort of constant to go from zero to fourth grade frostbite? Um, it's hard to get an exact time just because there's so many variables that come into play, both with the person and the cold conditions themselves. Um, because with the person, uh, you know, it's hard to tell if they have any underlying vascular disease or um, diabetes that would make them more prone to developing frostbite, more uh, severe frostbite more rapidly. Um, and in the same vein, um, the cold conditions, it's hard to tell, you know, is this something that's a prolonged cold that they have a glove that's just so significantly cold that it's taking a while? Or is this something where it's direct skin exposure with a moderate cold? So um, it's uh, unfortunately not a great way to be able to uh, have a, a direct linear relationship between the time frame of how fast you can go from first to fourth. So if I cut out the variability and give you a, a real world scenario, Keith Conover asked, given the temperature of the new um, uh, Pfizer uh, coronavirus vaccine in particular, contact frostbite could be an issue um, even in places like Florida and Hawaii for, for providers, not the recipients of the vaccine, but providers that may be handling this. Um, what advice do you guys have on contact frostbite for handling something that's at such a severe cold temperature? I'm, I'm sure they're taking precautions, but if something like this were, were to occur, any thoughts? Yeah, so, um, so dry ice burns are, are definitely a thing and they can cause pretty rapid uh, onset uh, frostbite. They're just different in the sense of, you know, they don't attack the absolute distal extremity the fastest. They're gonna attack wherever they're uh, touching. Um, and really the treatment is gonna be the same as all the rest of the frostbite treatment. It's going to be um, getting the cold exposure off of the direct skin contact um, and then getting them to a warm water bath as quickly as you can. Um, and then luckily both of those uh, areas, uh, you know, Florida and Hawaii are both in areas where you have access to uh, hyperbaric chambers that can uh, uh, be used for uh, more prolonged treatment to try to reverse any significant frostbite. Well, and speaking of Florida, um, there was a time, so uh, the, I think the latest uh, study on the most cases of hypothermia per capita in states, obviously Alaska's number one. I think Montana was number two and New Mexico was number three. You guys care to opine on how a state like New Mexico could be third in hypothermia of all states per capita? Um, so New Mexico still has a uh, pretty decent uh, areas that are pretty decently high altitude. Um, and so you do st still get the pretty significant cold winters um, because they do have the mountain ranges to the north. I think even one of the dim courses is run out of northern New Mexico. Um, so the environment set up, even though they don't necessarily have the same amount of uh, snowfall, they can still have a, they still have a pretty decent amount of cold exposure that they can get. Okay, I'm going to read one more out of chat. You guys can probably keep an eye on chat and then we might take a risk at opening up uh, the mics for everybody. We've got four minutes, but we're not afraid to, to run a little bit long. Somebody asked whether you guys want to comment on the first video clip that if the patient was already hypothermic, uh, walking them might have made that situation much, uh, much worse. Tell me your thoughts on that, guys. Yeah, and I, I don't know the details of, of that exposure. We have to go with what we saw on the television show. Um, but it, it looks like he was in an area that was pretty remote and they were in, a water, in the water for four or five hours. Um, and so I think they were just trying to get him to an area where they could get help um, based on the, the team he had with him uh, rather than, than getting him treated in the field. So. It's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through just a couple of questions you won't know the answer to, but not because I'm any smarter yeah. than you. I just, I know what MRI is doing. A, a, a rock star colleague of mine on Alpine Rescue, Linda Zaccardi asked if the, your PowerPoint's gonna be available. And I can answer that uh, to everybody that we are recording all of these. 
Uh, our first third Thursday a month ago with Dr. Christopher Van Tilburg is already on the MRA website. In fact, there's a link to it on the MRA homepage of the website. And we will bump Dr. Van Tilburg to a page further down and uh, put this recording on there. But uh, our plan is not to share PowerPoints alone because PowerPoints alone make it really, really difficult for um, for users to really understand uh, what the content was behind that. But this recording uh, will be will be aired on the MRA website through our YouTube. Um, and then a uh, question, while well, you guys are probably looking at the same one, can you elaborate, elaborate on chest walls that cannot be compressed um, to cold? You're looking at the same question probably. You guys want to answer that? Yeah, that's essentially you've frozen the tissue. Um, and so you've frozen the ribs, you've frozen the muscles, musculature of the chest wall, um, and that would be a, someone you can't do CPR on. Um, now, there was a comment in the, in the chat about delayed CPR. Um, so in theory, you could try to warm them up a little bit, see if that unfreezes enough that you can actually do compressions, but your odds of success are, are pretty darn low at that point. All right. Well, you're looking at chat just like me, so why don't you guys keep scrolling through and, and cherry pick some of the questions. I, I want to say I did appreciate uh, one of the comments that Keith made in the chat that uh, unless you have a hot tub in your pack, it is very hard to rewarm someone who's severely hypothermic. Um, you know, the, the methods that we talk about doing active rewarming, doing the hypo wraps, they're, they're pretty good if you've got someone who's mild to moderate. Um, once you get into that severe stage, there's just not enough heat and there's not enough energy that you can get in their system. You're not going to recover someone from severe to being able to rescue themselves. And so as far as when you're, when you're in the field, when you're planning your, what you're gonna do, planning what resources you need, you gotta under, kind of understand what your limitations are. Um, so that's a, it was a really good point to make for the chat. You see any others you wanna opine on? And then there's a good question here about uh, how hypothermia causes dysrhythmias and arrest on rough handling. And so the, the thought there is you're, you're already, your heart rate's already really, really slow. So you've got a lot of filling time, you've got a lot of delay in the conduction system already. And so if you were to rough handle somebody who's already that slow, it's easier to almost, it almost acts like a shock. It almost acts like a, a reset. Um, and almost like you're giving them a defibrillation by just the handling. And so that you could take someone who's got a rhythm, but it's not a super stable rhythm and knock them out of that. And so that's why the real concern is about handling, about keeping them horizontal, about being very careful with these patients uh, when they're very, very cold, just because they're very sensitive um, to any impact from the outside. Intermittent CPR. And, oh yeah, and then paradoxical undressing, also really weird. So I actually, in preparation for this talk, I went digging in and seeing if anyone actually had come up with a good physiologic mechanism, why paradoxical undressing occurs, and I could not find one. But the theory here is when your brain is not working right, um, you're gonna go back to your base caveman instincts and your base uh, processing in some sense. And what paradoxical undressing is, is they're going back to a burrowing response. So that's why you see, you'll find folks who are um, very hypothermic, they'll take off all their clothes and they'll go hide under a tree branch or they'll go try and hide under a building or a car, or, you know, and for the, the folks inside, you'll see them like under their couch. Um, and it's some core, you know, caveman um, response to that cold and thought to be basically, you're going to, going to die. Um, and so you're kind of almost preparing yourself to die. Um, so very weird, um, but you know we see it we see it in the field not infrequently um, with folks that that suffer severe hypothermia. So. Um, and let's see, we got one on severe hypothermic patients with inadequate uh, inadequate breathing. Um, so yeah, the eye gels, OPAs, BVMs um, are are all okay measures. You do have they while the GI transit system is slowing down, they do still have some ability to vomit. So you have to kind of be cautious a little bit from that standpoint. Um, you know, if they have a full belly and you run the risk of aspiration. Um, but it is something where if they are having slow enough respirations that you're concerned that they're actually becoming hypoxic, it's something that you can definitely progress to. Uh, 
think we're past seven o'clock now, but Charlie, any other ones that, that caught your eye or anything else that uh, you guys have questions on? Yeah, no, I think we're, I think we're good. We want to respect everybody's time. We've had a great hour with you guys. Uh, President Doug McCall, I want to invite, I know he's got to run to his team's meeting. And for those of you that have team trainings on Thursday, thanks for your indulgence. But um, Dr. Panetta, Dr. Alshut, we just really appreciate you guys and all your expertise. A reminder to everybody, this will be recorded. This is being recorded and will be presented up on the MRA's uh, main uh, webpage, uh, mra.org. Um, but just so grateful to you guys. Really appreciate it. We could go on for hours with the Q&A, but we want to respect everybody's time. And uh, Doug McCall, you want to add a closing comment or two? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, Charlie. Yeah, I just, just wanted to say thanks again for everyone uh, for attending. Uh, I, I hope you're finding this as useful as I am. Uh, we're going to, the uh, MRA officers and committees are continuing to work to uh, come up with new ideas. Uh, we're going to, we'll, we'll try some things and um, uh, some things will work and some things won't, but uh, hopefully uh, this, this one worked and it's, uh, because a lot of work that, that Charlie and his team uh, have done to make this happen. And um, we're, we're gonna uh, continue to continue to move forward. Uh, Zoom has actually been uh, good for us. It's get, given us a chance to, to see over 200 people join tonight. So that's, that's fantastic. So I really appreciate it again and uh, look forward to seeing everyone uh, next third Thursday, uh, and uh, hopefully maybe at the winter business meeting uh, on February uh, 6th and 7th. And we'll be sending out more information on that. Also, Charlie, on the Mountain Safety uh, Institute, um, or the MSI, I'll, I'll, I'm working with Oyvin to get the uh, sign-in instructions. We'll get that out uh, here shortly. Okay, and just real quickly, I've popped up the uh, next two presentations, January 21st. Uh, Sartopo, amazing things are happening with the with that technology. So we want to encourage you to come same time, same channel, third Thursday. And uh, Dale Atkins uh, on spring or summer, spring and summer avalanches. We're already booked out through May. So want to really encourage you to come and join us. I also noticed that uh, Lauren and Miguel added their uh, email addresses to the chat. Um, so as we say goodbye to everybody and thanks once again to Lauren and Miguel, um, I'm going to uh, leave this open so you can go through the chat and grab their email addresses and some of the other links. And in about 10 minutes, we'll, uh, we'll end the presentation. But thanks, everybody. Everybody stay safe in this crazy, unusual time. Trust that as first responders, you're all getting... Uh, uh, your uh, vaccinations lined up and uh, just thank everybody and look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks folks.